slow for it, so the minimum is very late for it. It's my pleasure to introduce Diana Kim this evening. Diana and I have been colleagues since 1996 here at Dow. Although Diana predated me, she joined the law faculty here in 1992 after having done uh, her undergraduate degree at Queens and then an LLM at Oscar and having worked as legal counsel and legal researcher in a variety of jurisdictions in Canada. Uh, Diana has done a lot of interesting work in different areas of the law, but of most significance for the session today, I thought I'd just flag a couple of things. Um, first off, she teaches law and religion here in the law school, um, and she's also written three books already, and is working on more, uh, on law and religion, so legal guides for religious institutions and other variants on uh, relating to that, so you know, providing really helpful information and guidance and really structure. Um, to religious organizations and to, to understand the law. Um, she's also written a number of articles on relationships between uh, the law and religion, so specifically, for instance, religious-based reasoning by judges, and also religious discourse. It's called Religious Discourse in the Public Square, so religion in, in, in public discourse. And then also, importantly, lives for intellectual commitments. And so you will find her volunteering at the um, Brunswick Street Breakfast Program and the Out of the Cold Emergency Homeless Shelter. So with that very brief introduction, I'm going to hand, oh, hand the floor over to Diana for what I am sure is going to be an engaging and challenging and interesting conversation, exploration <coughs> of religious freedom in Canada, the intersection of law and religion. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, John. First of all, I just have to say I'm absolutely thrilled to see that this many people would come out on a Friday night, uh, uh, February night, not quite Friday, on a February night to talk about law and religion. So I think it's such an interesting topic and I hope that you do too. I will talk for a little while but certainly leave time at the end for questions and conversation as I'm very interested to hear what you think about some of the topics that I'm going to be raising. Um, Jocelyn mentioned that I teach a law and religion course here at Dalhousie and I started that course about five years ago uh, because I felt that there were so many interesting issues that fell under that heading of law and religion, of how law and religion uh, affect each other. Certainly speaking for myself, law and theology are two ways of thinking about the world that interest me greatly and I would suggest to you that also perhaps law and religion have certain uh, similarities. The both of them speak to us about how we live in community with each other and what obligations and duties that we have toward each other. I would also suggest to you that perhaps at their best and finest law and religion can do similar wonderful things and at their worst law and religion can do terrible things. But I'm very, very interested um, in the intersection between the two, and particularly what is and what should be the relationship between law and religion in a secular, democratic, multi-faith society such as Canada. So what are the ways in which the law protects religion in Canada, and what are the ways in which the law constrains religion in Canada? In the interest of time, I'm going to focus on Section 2A of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which guarantees freedom of conscience and religion. But certainly, as I said at the end, I'll leave time for questions and comments, and if there's any other aspects about the interaction between law and religion that you would like to speak about, uh, please raise them. So as I mentioned, Section uh, 2A of the uh, Charter speaks of the freedom of conscience and religion. And these are, in fact, the very first rights specified in the Charter. And some have suggested that this is no accident, that in fact, freedom of religion can be seen as the grandfather, or perhaps the grandmother, of all other human rights and protections. Thus, it's suggested that in, or at least some would suggest, others would disagree, of course, it is suggested by some that, at least in the Western tradition, the growing realization that, as the Supreme Court of Canada said in the first uh, freedom of religion case under the Charter that it des decided, the court said the, um, spoke of the growing perception that belief is not amenable to compulsion, that that growing perception was actually the precursor to the really quite radical notion 
that the power of the king or the power of the state should not be all-encompassing. And while I am going to focus on the Charter, which of course, as you all know, became part of our Constitution in 1982, it would be wrong to assume that freedom of religion played no role in Canadian law before 1982. Certainly, the recognition given to the freedom of worship and civil rights to Catholics after the fall of New France in 1759 was fairly noteworthy at the time. And there's case law, too, well before the Charter, that speaks about freedom of religion. And these are, this sentiment is perhaps particularly strongly articulated in a series of cases coming out of Quebec in the 1950s, where you see the very Catholic uh, majority uh, Catholic government attempting to place real restrictions on Jehovah's Witnesses. And a no number of times this was challenged, all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Supreme Court of Canada, and it's including its Catholic judges, made some quite ringing observations on freedom of religion. So I'll just quote to you from one. This is a case from 1955 where um, police had sort of run into a house or come into a house where there was a group of Jehovah's Witnesses holding a worship ceremony, dispersed everyone, told everyone to go home, seized Bibles, seized hymn books, seized religious pamphlets. And this was challenged as having no legal authority, this action on the part of the police. It went to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada agreed and said, and here I'm kind of quoting loosely from the French, but this is basically what they said, in our country there exists no state religion. Anyone is entitled to adhere to any belief that they wish. All religions are on an equal footing. The same for Catholics as Protestants, Jews, or other adherents of diverse denominations. All have the entire liberty to think as they wish. The conscience of each is an affair, or is the business of, of each person, and no one else's business. It would be terrible to think that a majority could impose its religious views on a minority. It is a profound error to believe that one serves one's country or one's religion to refuse to a minority the same rights that we claim for ourselves. 1955. And another Supreme Court of Canada also dealing with altercations between the government in Quebec and the Jehovah's Witnesses from around the same era spoke of freedom of religion as a fundamental right and said that freedom of religion together with freedom of expression and freedom of association, are the necessary preconditions for community life together under a legal order. And besides the case law, there's also the Bill of Rights, which of course came into being in 1960, which refers to God, uh, the supremacy of God, in its preamble, and also talks about freedom of religion. But wonderful as all this sounds, there of course were, as any of you would know, uh, who have looked into this, distinct limitations. Certainly with the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights on all fronts did next to nothing. There were a couple of cases where the Bill of Rights actually did something significant. Other than that, let's be real, it was totally useless. Even the common law, the judge-made law, the judge-developed law that I was quoting from a moment ago, was wonderful and ringing endorsements of freedom of religion, that could always be trumped by legislation. And so, uh, while the court, in the case that I uh, quoted for you, says all religions are on equal footing in that era, pre-charter, if a government had decided to pass legislation that placed some religions on a lower footing, well, that was that. That was the end of the story. The legislation carried the day. And so, of course, it's that that makes the protection of religion in the Constitution, in the Charter, so significant to be able to speak of rights and freedoms in the Charter as entrenched, as constitutionally protected. Because just as legislation, just as statutes passed by government will trump the common law developed by the judges, so too can the Constitution trump legislation. This, of course, doesn't mean, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, this doesn't for a minute mean that the rights and freedoms in the Charter are absolute. They aren't. But constitutional protection does mean that legislation can be challenged and sometimes challenged successfully. So I, I want to talk about those challenges and how the courts have responded to 
challenges to legislation and government policy under Section 2A. I would, just sort of as an aside, note that uh, the preamble also speaks of God, talks about Canada being founded upon the principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. That's the preamble to the Charter. Now, as you can probably imagine, the discussion about whether or not to include God in the preamble was at times a bit heated. And apparently in one of these conversations, Trudeau, a committed Catholic, remarked, quote, I don't think God gives a damn whether he's in the Constitution or not. <laughs> but God made it in there. However, the preamble has not played any particular role in interpreting the rights and freedoms. It has not been seen as expanding freedom of religion and has in fact been described as a dead letter. In fact, really having no impact on much of anything. Uh, before we go on, a couple of things to note about the Charter. First of all, it only applies to government activity. And as I mentioned before, the rights and freedoms set out in it are not absolute. And of course, this is because of Section 1 of the Charter, which states the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject only to such reasonable limits and freedoms sorry, such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So if someone goes to court and challenges a piece of legislation or a government policy saying this violates my freedom of religion, it's quite possible that the government may argue, well, okay, even if it does violate your freedom of religion, it should still be upheld because it is a reasonable limit that can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So what in general terms do we mean by freedom of religion? How has this phrase been interpreted by judges? And I would suggest to you that when judges say, here's what we think about freedom of religion, or in particular the Supreme Court of Canada says, here's what freedom of religion should mean. They use beautiful and broad and sweeping phrases when they get down to the nitty gritty of actually looking at particular cases, I think you could argue that sometimes they come down to slightly narrower decisions. But certainly there are lovely and eloquent and sweeping phrases in what the Supreme Court of Canada has to tell us. So I'm going to start with a quotation from a case called Big M Drug Mart, decided by the Supreme Court of Canada in 1985, and in fact the first decision of the Supreme Court of Canada under Section 2A of the Charter. And this was a case in which the uh, court struck down Sunday closing legislation. And the then Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, Chief Justice Dixon, said, and this is kind of one of those quotable quotes, like anybody who's writing or talking about freedom of religion kind of goes to this as, as, as a good quotable quote. And it is, it truly is a quotable quote. So I'll quote it to you. A truly free society is one which can accommodate a wide variety of beliefs, diversity of tastes and pursuits, customs and codes of conduct. A free society is one which aims at equality with respect to the enjoyment of fundamental freedoms. Freedom must surely be founded in respect for the inherent dignity and rights of the human person. The essence of the concept of freedom of religion is the right to entertain such religious beliefs as a person chooses, the right to declare religious beliefs openly and without fear of hindrance or reprisal, and the right to manifest religious belief by worship and practice or by teaching and dissemination. But the concept means more than that. And so uh, the court goes on to tell us that freedom of religion must be interpreted broadly and that it encompasses protection against both direct and indirect state coercion. So of course direct state coercion would be something like, you know, you must worship in this way, you must believe in this way, you must follow these religious practices, whatever. In terms of indirect coercion, it was in this Big M Drug Mart case that the court explicitly rejected the argument that Sunday closing legislation doesn't really affect the freedom of religion, of those who hold a holy day other than Sunday. It may have a financial impact on them, but it doesn't really affect the freedom of religion, went the argument that the court rejected. And said that kind of argument doesn't recognize that the Charter also protects against indirect coercion. 
And certainly in keeping with the idea that religion and freedom of religion should be interpreted very broadly, uh, some years later in 2004, in a case called Amsalom, we see the Supreme Court of Canada again reiterating the need to give freedom of religion a very broad meaning and saying we must do so in order to enhance personal autonomy and avoid the state becoming involved in judging the merits of religious doctrine. And so talks about the right to undertake and practice beliefs, any beliefs having a nexus with religion that one sincerely believes they are called upon to follow, irrespective of whether that particular belief or practice is required by official religious dogma or is in conformity with the position of religious officials. In other words, if I wanted to go in and argue that something violated my freedom of religion, I would have to persuade the court of the sincerity of my religious beliefs. But according to this, if I were the only person on the face of the earth that believed that this is what religion called me to do, that should be sufficient. I wouldn't have to call in a minister or a priest or a rabbi or whomever or call in you know, a number of other people to show, look, you know, we believe in that too. So very, very broad statement about freedom of religion coming out of that case. We've also been told that freedom of religion requires that the state must be neutral, both as among different religions and also as between religion and non-religion. And that the charter protects both freedom of religion and freedom from religion. So I thought I'd give you a little sampling of the kinds of cases that have come up under Section 2A. And then after that, talk about some of the challenges that have arisen. So, and these are not all the freedom of religion cases out there, but they're a fair number. And I'm saying give you a little bit of a sense of the kinds of claims that have been made. And I've divided them up into three categories. And the first category are those cases where the court has said, nope, no freedom of religion violation here at all. Don't even need to go on and think about whether or not it could be justified under Section 1 because there's no freedom of religion violation at all. So starting with a very recent case from the Supreme Court of Canada, and one which I'll be talking about a bit more later, the court held that it is not a violation of freedom of religion for a school board to introduce a mandatory program for school children on ethics and religious culture and to refuse to exempt from that program children whose parents object to it. We'll come back to that one. The lower level uh, case that tells us that a criminal prohibition on carrying a concealed weapon does not violate the freedom of religion of an individual who claimed that he was carrying a knife as part of the Wiccan religion. The requirement under the Income Tax Act to file income tax returns and pay income taxes does not violate the freedom of religion of individuals who object for religious reasons to certain aspects of government policy. Allowing Sikh members of the RCMP to wear turbans with their uniforms does not violate the freedom of religion of non-Sikh Canadians. Because of security reasons, denying inc incense and beads to a prisoner on remand does not infringe his freedom of religion. Legislation making the wearing of seat belts mandatory does not affect freedom of religion. And finally, the military requirement on occasion to sing God Save the Queen does not violate freedom of religion. So do you get kind of a sense of the kinds of cases that have been brought? The next category uh, is where the court said, you know what, you're right. That legislation or that policy does violate freedom of religion but it can be upheld because it is demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So, Sunday closing legislation that was found not to have a religious purpose, but to have a secular purpose of providing a common day of rest was upheld. As you know, probably because it's been in the news in the last year or so, the criminal code po uh, prohibition on polygamy has been upheld. Uh, some cases around ordering uh, medical treatment for children over the religious objections of their parents. It's kind of gone a number of different ways in how they characterize this, 
but some of them have said, yes, it's maybe a violation of the parents' rights, but nonetheless justified. And legislation requiring anyone who operates a motorcycle to wear a helmet was held to violate the freedom of religion of the Sikh who challenged it, who said, I can't wear a helmet over my turban, but the court found that that was reasonable under Section 1. So my third category are cases where the legislation or policy challenged was found to violate freedom of religion, and the court held that that violation could not be justified under Section 1, and therefore the legislation, or at least the portion being focused on, or the policy, would need to be struck down for being inconsistent with the Charter. So, Sunday closing legislation, whose purpose was to impose a Christian Sabbath, was a violation and unjustifiable. Religious teaching in public schools aimed at religious doctrination, indoctrination in a particular faith, uh, struck down. A complete prohibition by a school board on a student wearing a kirpan, the ceremonial uh, dagger of the Sikh religion, struck down. Requiring a member of the Canadian Armed Forces who is not a believer to remove his or her headgear during prayers on a military base violates freedom of religion and cannot be justified. A restriction on door-to-door -door soliciting and dis distribution of pamphlets linked to religious purpose violates freedom of religion and cannot be justified. And my own personal favorite, a municipal bylaw prohibiting residents from keeping horses in residential areas within a particular hamlet in Ontario violated the freedom of religion of those Amish who felt the religion forbade them to have a car and who used a horse to get around and the court said that violates your freedom of religion and it really can't be justified. You can keep your horse. So that's just a little sampling of the kinds of cases that have been brought under Section 2A and the kinds of responses that you have from the court, all the way from saying your freedom of religion isn't violated at all, to saying it is violated but that's justifiable, to saying it is violated and that's not justifiable, and therefore the legislation or policy must be struck down. I want to talk to you now a little bit about some of the challenges that arise out of uh, Section 2A and interpretations of it in cases that have uh, arisen. And I, I do have my eye on the clock because I want to make sure that we do leave plenty of time for discussion. Before I go on to talk about the challenges, I, I don't want to play, paint an overly be bleak picture. I do want to say that I think there's real promise uh, and benefit in having freedom of religion entrenched. Uh, that it certainly provides protection significantly beyond that available at the common law. Uh, I think that it, in theory at least, provides the possibility of protection for beliefs that are somewhat outside the social norm of the time. And above all, I think it requires courts and legislatures and perhaps even the public to think about what it is that we want to protect in the name of freedom of religion and why we want to protect that. And I think that that's a very useful thing to think about in terms of what kind of a society do we want to create. But I want to go on and talk about two major challenges in interpreting Section 2A. Not the only two out there, but two. The first is how to resolve tensions between freedom of religion and other charter rights and freedoms. And the second is to look at the situation where a law is quite possibly generally reasonable and doesn't trouble most people, but is seen to have a negative effect on certain individuals who are identifiable by religion. And in that context, should a court take an all or nothing position, saying either the law stands for all or falls for all, or should there be the possibility of upholding the law generally, but providing some kind of accommodation for those whose freedom of religion is affected. So those are the two tensions or difficulties or questions that I want to talk about, recognizing that there may be others that you will want to talk about when we get to the chatting stage. So 
The first one that I talked about was how to resolve tensions between freedom of religion and other charter rights and freedoms. And I would say to you that this is a fundamental issue, particularly given that the Supreme Court of Canada has told us that there is no hierarchy of rights amongst charter rights and freedoms. So how should courts respond when you see uh, or when allegedly or somebody feels that freedom of religion is coming up against some other equally protected, equally in constitutionally entrenched right or freedom. What do we do then? And I want to talk about this under two headings. First of all, the possibility of freedom of religion being seen as being in conflict with multiculturalism, and then the tension between freedom of religion and equality rights. Now those are not the only tensions we could think of within the Charter, but those are ones on which there is some case law to kind of talk about. How do we balance and how do we weigh, particularly given that, uh, as I said a moment ago, we have been told there is no hierarchy of rights. So thinking about this conflict between religion and multiculturalism takes me back to the Quebec school board case that I mentioned and that I said I was going to come back to. And this is a, a 2012 decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. And here, as I said, you have a school board in Quebec which introduced a mandatory program for school children on ethics and religious culture. And it said its purpose was to provide moral education and to allow religion to be studied from a cultural perspective. And exemptions were not available to those children whose parents objected to the course on religious grounds. So, perhaps not surprisingly, there was a challenge. You have parents who challenge this and say, we don't want our children in that program. It's our duty, said the parents, not the duty of the school, our duty, to educate our children about religion. And that program is going to impede us in educating our children about religion because it's going to introduce moral relativism and suggest that all religions and philosophies are of equal value, and by golly, that's not what we believe. The Supreme Court of Canada accepted that the parents were sincere in their religious beliefs, but, felt, but held that they had not shown that their ability to pass on their Christian faith, they were Catholic, to pass on their Christian faith, was infringed by having their kids in this program. And the court said to hold otherwise would be, quote, a rejection of the multicultural reality of Canadian society and would ignore the Quebec government's obligation with regard to public education. Now, I have a bit of a problem with that. I don't actually have a problem with the course. Like if I'd been in Quebec, I'd be sending my kids to that course so happily. But I have a little bit of a problem with the court's reasoning here. The court told us in an, easier, in an earlier case, the Anselm case, that we must interpret freedom of religion broadly in order to avoid the possibility of the court passing judgment on the merit of various religious doctrines. Now, there may be times when the court will uphold an infringement, a violation of freedom of religion, will uphold a curtailment of religious uh, freedom because in the eyes of the court that is demonstrably justified, perhaps because the religious beliefs and practices professed have caused harm to others, or perhaps because uh, striking down the legislation would impede some beneficial government program. But arguably, the court should not be rejecting freedom of religion claims at the 2A stage, remember there's still time to do balancing in section one. Arguably, the court should not be rejecting freedom of religion claims at the section 2A stage simply because it thinks that this is bad religion. Now, of course, the court doesn't say that's what they're doing in this case. But I would suggest to you that it comes fairly close to that line. Because there really does seem to be an air in the court's reasoning along the lines of, well, how could any sensible religion object to children learning about general ethics and other religions? 
You know, you say that you want to teach your children that there's just one true faith, yours, not so sure that that's the kind of religious belief that we want to protect. Now, of course, they don't come out and say that, but that does seem to be rather implicit in some of the comments. The court simply says that to find that this school policy that made attending this program mandatory, to find that it would be a violation of freedom of religion would be, as I said a moment ago, a rejection of the multicultural reality of Canadian society and would ignore Quebec, the Quebec government's obligation with regard to public education. I would suggest that once the Supreme Court of Canada found that the parents were sincere in their belief that they were obligated to teach their children about Catholicism and obligated to protect their children from the confusion of exposure to other faiths, that would be sufficient to ground a freedom of religion claim. In other words, to say, yes, there is a violation. Let's now move on to section one and see whether or not that violation is justified. And at that stage, the obligation would have lain on the, sh on the government to show why a limitation was justified. And that would have been the government's opportunity to argue that uh, this was neutrality uh, and multiculturalism justified this limitation. I I'd suggest to you that it's hard to see how granting an exemption would necessarily make, to those kids whose parents objected, would necessarily make the state less than neutral. Now, it might be that there are stronger arguments uh, based on multiculturalism. Perhaps the government would have been able to show that allowing children to be exempted from this program would lead to fostering enclaves of disrespect for the multicultural and multi-faith nature of Canada. And if that could have been proven, that might have been a mighty good reason for saying, let us uphold the mandatory nature of the program and let us uh, say that this violation of freedom of religion has been justified. But I would have liked to see the government sort of be put to the proof of having to show that that would, in, a, in effect, be the outcome here, instead of just saying, like, wh what are you on about? How can you claim this is going to harm your ability to teach your kids what it is that you want to teach? Given that, the court is not supposed to be judging whether or not the doctrine that these parents want to teach their children is a doctrine that, that they agree with or that you or I would agree with. So in other words, the outcome might have been the same, I don't know, but it seems to me that it would have been um, useful to have had a fuller discussion and that it would have been less dismissive of the parents' claim to have done that balancing and that weighing at the section one stage rather than just blithely assuring the parents that their ability to pass on the religious faith to their children had not, despite their fears, been harmed. Perhaps the even more difficult issues arise in the context where we have conflict between freedom of religion and equality rights. And these cases, I would say to you, are about as difficult as you can get. Fundamental and important freedoms clashing or potentially clashing with each other. And so I'm just going to give you a number of examples from uh, the cases. One of these comes from Saskatchewan, where you have marriage commissioners. These are people who are appointed by government to perform secular, non-religious marriages. And so after same-sex marriage becomes legal in Canada, you have a number of marriage commissioners who say, no, I don't want to be performing any such marriages. That would be against my freedom of religion. And the Saskatchewan government says, oh, OK, yeah, no, no problem. We'll just pass some legislation exempting you exempting anybody, any marriage commissioner, from performing any marriage that would be in violation of their uh, own religious views. And it really was that broad, for any reason. So, you know, you wake up tomorrow and you decide that you're opposed to interracial marriages, or you wake up the next day and you decide that you're opposed to uh, marriages between people of two different religions. This uh, exemption in the proposed Saskatchewan legislation got struck down. Um, would have said, that's just tickety-boo. You just look that couple in the eye and tell them that you're not going to marry them. And not surprisingly, this was challenged, and 
the Supreme Court of Canada held that this kind of an outright exemption, where a marriage commissioner could just look at somebody and go, nope, based on my religious views, I'm not going to marry you, uh, could not be upheld because it would be such an infringement of equality rights. Now, it's important to note, though, that the court didn't make complete sweeping absolutist statements here. It did suggest that it might be able to come up with some kind of a scheme where uh, marriage commissioners could have somewhat more choice, but in ways that were less devastating to the couple that turns up and gets turned away. Uh, but certainly the blanket exemption that the Saskatchewan government was proposing was seen as um, too, uh, too much of a violation of equality rights. Uh, as many, again, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, the, the criminal ban on polygamy uh, is seen as, was recognized, was accepted by the uh, Supreme Court of, of British Columbia as violating the freedom of religion of those groups and communities who believe that polygamy is what God calls them to, or this, how God calls them to live. But held that the restriction, that the prohibition on, on polygamy was justified uh, because of the need to protect vulnerable groups, particularly women and children within the community, and certainly within the focus on women, there was a focus on equality rights. Again, um, a slightly different take on, on, on equality rights, but um, again, a case that has certainly garnered some media attention, uh, a case in which the complainant in a sexual assault trial wished to be able to testify while wearing her niqab, face covering. And uh, this went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada to say, can she, can't she, can she sometimes? Uh, and here the argument was that the accused was saying, we're not going to get as, fair, uh, as, as good a shot at a fair trial as would everybody else if she is allowed to testify wearing her niqab. And the court split in various ways, but the majority said in, in perhaps a truly Canadian fashion, well, it depends. It depends on the context. Sometimes she'll have to take it off, and sometimes she won't have to take it off, but it depends. And that was sort of what the, the four in the middle said. Two said, by golly, yes, she should have to take it off any time, and one said she should never have to take it off, and then you had kind of these, these four in the middle. There are also um, important questions around how courts should interpret hate speech provisions, particularly in the context of limiting uh, religiously motivated expression, which is targeting particularly vulnerable individuals or uh, communities. How do we work that conflict between um, freedom of religion and freedom of expression, but equality rights for those individuals and communities? So I do, that's the, the first challenge that I wanted to raise for you with no simple answers. But at least to say, think about it. How should courts respond when you have this clash between freedom of religion and another constitutionally protected freedom or right? The second challenge, which I'll talk about a bit more briefly, is when it's found that legislation infringes the freedom of religion of some particular group within society. You know, everyone else is probably kind of okay with it, but it infringes the freedom of religion of some particular group. Should the court say either, you know, the legislation stands for all or the legislation falls for all, or should there be some possibility of accommodation, keeping the legislation, but accommodation for those who feel who are affected by it, whose freedom of religion is affected. And this came before the Supreme Court of Canada in a fairly recent decision dealing with a Hutterite community in Alberta who challenged provincial legislation which said, if you want to have a driver's license, you're going to have to have a driver's license with your picture on it. And this community believed that having one's picture taken violates the second commandment which says, thou shalt not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or the waters below. And in their view, having a picture of themselves taken and put on their, on their uh, 
driver's license would be in contravention of this commandment. So the Supreme Court of Canada acknowledged that this legislation violated the freedom of religion of the Hutterites. And, and the justification offered by the government was that they were really trying to crack down on identity theft and that having uh, driver's licenses with pictures on it was not the only component, but a significant component on this sort of um, effort to crack down on I identity theft. And the majority said, there was a dissent, but the majority said that is demonstrably justified, that limit on the freedom of religion <coughs> is demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, therefore the legislation stands and no, there will not be sort of accommodation for you know, this Hutterite community or for others who would uh, feel that their religion did not allow the taking of their picture. The, the majority said, look, the legislation is constitutionally valid, therefore it's constitutionally valid for everyone. One might argue that this could be seen as being somewhat at odds with an earlier case where the constitutional validity of a school board policy that perhaps prohibited all weapons on school grounds, and which was interpreted, therefore, to include the Kirpan, that was struck down, and quite clearly one of the reasons that it was struck down was that it was so absolute. So the Supreme Court of Canada, not surprisingly, uh, recognized that there was a good rationale between trying to ban weapons on the school grounds, but said that the policy should be able to accommodate those whose religion was affected. Uh, in particular, I mean, here the parents of the child had bent over backwards and said they'll wrap the kirpan in cloth and sew it into his clothing and so on. The idea that he could whip that out in a school fight and cause any trouble just really wasn't on the books at all. But the school board policy was just absolute. And the court said a total prohibition against wearing a kirpan to school undermines the value of this religious symbol and sends students the message that some religious practices do not merit the same protection as, other, as others. On the other hand, accommodating this student and allowing him to wear his kirpan under, under certain conditions, which was of course the parents being very willing to sew it into his clothing, demonstrates the importance that our society attaches to protecting freedom of religion and showing respect for its minorities. Now, one could say, but those two cases are different. One dealt with a policy, a policy of the school board, and the other dealt with a statute, a provincial statute around, um, around licenses. And certainly, there could be significant difficulty to having sort of accommodation or uh, in the face of, of, of legislation, you could end up with a very sort of patchwork set of rights and so on. But I guess my concern in this case was that it felt that the majority dismissed the possibility of accommodation mighty briskly. A and again, I think I would at least have liked to have seen a more fulsome discussion about if providing accommodation uh, for those whose freedom of religion is violated by legislation, if that won't work, it would be nice to tell us more fulsomely why that wouldn't work, and to assure us that you have thought through um, the, the various possibilities. So again, I would see that as another issue that uh, needs to be thought through more fully. So in closing, and we will have time for conversation, in closing I would suggest to you, first of all, that despite some of my criticisms here, we do in Canada have a reasonably robust sense of freedom of religion. I would suspect that in many countries around the world, the freedom of religion that we uh, enjoy here in Canada would be the, the, the envy of, of many. Uh, the very fact that it is protected in our charter suggests that it has significant weight. But of course, how it's interpreted also will tell us how much weight and how broad and how deep our commitment is to religious freedom. And I would suggest that for religious freedom to have any real meaning, we do have to be willing to protect certain beliefs and practices that don't fit with, pre with prevailing norms. Because after all, if your beliefs and practices fit with prevailing norms, you don't really need constitutional protection. That is not to say that freedom of religion 
should be placed at the top of a hierarchy. That is not to say that freedom of religion should never be violated and, and that that could never be justified under Section 1. Absolutely there are times, I believe, when freedom of religion needs to be tamped down in, other, in order to protect other profoundly valuable uh, rights and freedoms and values in our society. But uh, I do think that we need to think long and hard about how to strike that balance. And I do think, I, I guess I, my, I want to go back to that theme that sometimes protection may need to be given to, to things that are seen as weird or strange or out there or problematic or, or, or whatever by, by the majority. And I certainly know for myself that there are times when I look at cases and I think, you know, morally and theologically, I love the outcome, but I think the legal reasoning is really quite suspect. And I think we do have to be careful how we go about thinking about any of the, the rights and freedoms in, in the Charter, including freedom of religion, and, and uh, thinking about how do we give them, how do we give that freedom or that right significant weight, while also recognizing that there will be tough, tough cases where something equally important will be clashing with it, and there is no easy answer. So I think I'll stop there. Um, and as I say, I've only talked about the charters. You want to talk about other things, human rights cases and so on, I'm happy to. Whatever you would like to chat about under the heading of uh, law and religion, I'm happy to chat. So I'll open it up for questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the Senate reason by McLaughlin, one of the questions that the court has to ask is about the sincerity of their religious belief. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you thought that the court should be making an inquiry into the sincerity of the belief. Ooh, and if so, how good. should they? And that's a really good question. That certainly came up. The first time we see this real emphasis from the court, this really explicit emphasis from the court around sincerity is in the Anselm case, where uh, the court says, look, it doesn't matter if other people share your religious views or not. It doesn't matter if you can be, bring in some religious leader to support your views. What matters is that you are sincere. But then goes on and says, really, we shouldn't inquire into that too closely because there's obvious uh, problems there. On the one hand, I think you can see the, the um, relevance of sincerity that somebody just saying, I don't really like that law. I think I'll just claim me some freedom of religion is obviously not somewhere that you want to go. On the other hand, uh, probing into sincerity, I think we have done a little bit heavy, ha heavily handedly, can be a problem. And certainly even in, in the case that, that we're talking about here, at the first level, when the woman first makes this claim, and the judge is trying to uh, determine whether or not she's sincere, there's sort of this line of, of question about, have you ever taken it off? When did it take off? Oh, took it off. Took it off to have, I think it was actually her, her picture taken for her license. Now that I think about it, oh, you can't be all that sincere, can you now? Well, well, that seems an incredibly intrusive and simplistic take on what it means to be sincere about one's religion and, and a very sort of uncontextual take on what, on what it means. And so I, I think that there is quite rightly a concern about um, how, how do you, on the one hand, say, let's make sure this is a real claim? But on the other hand, not say, um, well, that's, that's certainly not the way I'd act. If I was sincere in my views, I guess you can't be sincere in your views. I mean, there's so much worry there about um, judgment, <coughs> perhaps particularly the judgment when you have somebody from one religion trying to assess sincerity of somebody from another religion, which frankly they probably aren't particularly familiar with. So there are some real dangers there. On the other hand, I, you know, I, I can see why, that, why the court does talk about that um, as, as a relevant aspect. Yes? Yeah, a couple of things. It may surprise you, but a few years ago, I wrote an op-ed for the uh, Cape Breton Post uh, in favor of Sunday closing laws in Nova well, Scotia. That doesn't surprise me, Rabbi. <laughs> Even though I might not benefit from that, although I have to observe the Sabbath day for that. But uh, I did it because of two reasons. Because in my past, I remember as a kid when it was kind of nice when things were kind of shut down. It was nice to come to a place where I've lived in a place where I saw it eroded over the years and it was 
Sunday comes a hubbub day, just like every other day of the week, and that, and also living in Jerusalem for many years there. It's just nice to see Saturday there being the day where the place is like that. And so I was defending it on a public welfare sort of thing. If I was to make an argument now, I'd make a green argument that we can have one day of the week where we don't have to do that. But it seems like I don't know if the churches are even going that way anymore. The one place having some success with, oddly enough, I think is the secular realm in Europe. I think the European Union there it has people resisting. The, there's been pushed to do Sunday shopping there, but the European Union, not because they're so holy or pious or anything, but they say it's a traditional day. It doesn't have work in it. So keep, they're more effective in holding that Sunday closing day than I think the rest of North America is. So could there be, didn't there, wasn't there something in the old law about the Lord's Day or something like this? There could be arbitrary whether the Jews have to, could Jews work on Sunday if they declare it Saturday their Lord's Day or something? I don't know. Well, interesting, the first two cases that came down from the Supreme Court of Canada on freedom of religion both involved challenges to legislation, Sunday closing legislation. In the first case, the court struck down the legislation. In the second case, the court upheld it. And if that's all you knew, you might be tempted to look at and think, like, did you forget what you did last year? But that isn't the case. The court held it in, in the first case, with the, the legislation which had the rather telltale name of the Lord's Day Act, that that was actually intended to sort of inculcate Christian faith okay. and, and a Christian Sabbath, and that therefore it had been passed for a religious purpose. And in that case, the court made the quite striking statement, I think, that if a piece of legislation is passed for a religious purpose, that is it, game over, the legislation is invalid. You cannot go on to section one and try to justify it because there is no justification in a country such as Canada for legislation which is passed for a religious purpose. On the other hand, if, religion is, if legislation is passed for a secular purpose but happens to have a particular impact on certain people because of religion, which was the case with the Business Retail Holiday Act, or whatever it was called in the second, piece, second case, it was passed for a secular reason, said the court, exactly the reason that you sort of suggested, isn't it nice to have a day when most people can stay at home, but had an impact on those who celebrated another Sabbath. That, because of a secular purpose, could go on and be discussed at section one to see if there was or was not justification. And the court held there that there was justification and upheld the legislation. Was there ever a corollary of the Lord's Act, whatever it was, that said a religion has a very well-founded, definite other day than Sunday, such as the Jews for the Sabbath, could opt out and they could close their store on Saturday and keep their deli open on Sunday? There, there was, was there something like that? Yeah, in the Ontario legislation that, that was the <laughs> focus of the second case, there actually was an exemption or exception in there that said, and you had to meet all three criteria. If you've only got, you had to, it couldn't be a big store. You had to have only so many square feet, whatever yeah. that was. And only so many employees, so. And you had to have had your store closed for a full 24 hours within a certain period before Sunday. So you closed on Saturday, you didn't have over whatever the number of, of employees was, and you didn't have over the square footage, then you actually could open on Sunday. Uh -huh. And so the majority of the court certainly took that into account, okay. too, in saying, look, they're trying to be reasonable, and there's a secular purpose here, and let's uphold it. Uh, Justice Wilson said, even that's problematic. It's still too limited. Um, that's not good. And interestingly, not long after the case, after having probably spent a fair bit of time and money in court arguing to uphold the legislation, my understanding is that, on that Ontario changed it and actually um, was one of the forerunners of, of opening up for Sunday uh, yeah. shopping. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. People like to chat about yes. this, Paul. Is there any overlapping in, uh, case law of the relationship between religion and conscience, mm. which are the two terms that are contained within that charter provision? Mm. There's really very little on that yet. Certainly, I think it's fair to say that historically, conscience and religion would have been seen as completely intertwined. In other words, in an era when we assumed that everybody had some set of religious beliefs, however different they might be, we would have assumed that one's conscience was shaped by those religious beliefs. Um, 
And even in 1985, not that long ago, in the Big M drug case, with the various quotable quotes by uh, Chief Justice Dixon, he doesn't really make any distinction. He just says, conscience and religion, conscience and religion. Religion allows you to act in accordance with your conscience, conscience and religion. He doesn't really make any particular distinction between them. Now, I, have, I, I thought perhaps even in 1985, but certainly in today's world, I think we would have recognition that some have um, strongly held and profoundly important uh, conscientious beliefs or conscientious objections that would be based on a secular worldview, a secular set of comprehensive um, beliefs and values, not a religious one. And therefore, I, think would be, I don't think we would try to argue today that the two are just, you know, nifty little synonyms for each other. On the other hand, there's not really much there in the case law to tell us how we should think about them differently. There's certainly some writing on it. Some have even suggested that conscience is a sufficiently broad term that really it could encompass religion. That we don't really need religion as another term because if we said conscience is simply what you profoundly believe you are called to do or not do, then what does it matter whether that's from a religious or a secular basis, and therefore conscience could include both. Others have argued that conscience has a particularly individualistic uh, aspect to it, and that at least sometimes freedom of religion may have a more community or collective aspect to it, which would be lost if we didn't keep the two terms separately. But th that's a fascinating area, but not one that's sorted out or settled yet. Yes? Uh, just related to that, would political beliefs be in the realm of conscience? If you hold a belief that you know, one of the major parties holds, I, I can't give you an example but it's infringed, but uh, like, is that protected under, under the Constitution? I mean, certainly, uh, often I think what you see is political expression uh, protected under the freedom of expression. But I mean, arguably, one could have an intersection between conscience and um, conscience and political belief. I mean, say you were, <coughs> let's, let's keep religion out of it, let's say for secular reasons, for non-religious reasons, you were um, a pacifist. You could presumably start up the, the pacifist party, you know, and, 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 and they could have political overtones, but also overtones of conscience. Uh, but certainly if, if there was um, expression or association, those are also, as you would know, um, freedoms that are protected in the charity, which could be very relevant to, to political uh, commentary. Yes. Um, I don't know if this is too soon to ask, but how do you see the relationship between this religion on as it exists in the law and the new commission on freedom of religion that was just, mm, just opened yesterday, yesterday. yesterday? I know, I thought, what good timing. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Who knows, eh? Like, who knows what that's, that's going to be? And this is, as I'm sure you all know, is the idea that there's going to be this Office of Religious Freedom that's. Um, at the federal level is going to tie in with our um, with foreign affairs, yeah. And there's really three views on it. There's those who say, what a horrible idea. This is simply an effort by that Harper government to take Christianity, conservative Christianity, and thrust it down the throats of those who would like to be free of it. There are those who say, what a great idea, or it could be a great idea. Surely, if in our, as in our sort of, uh, foreign affairs, if we uh, want to speak out strongly about the protection of human rights, one subset of human rights would be religious freedom, the freedoms of any religious minority, not just Christianity. And there's a perhaps rather cynical third view that just goes, oh no, another sinkhole in which our taxpayer dollars <laughs> will disappear. And I don't know. I guess I'll have to wait. Um, I would be profoundly uh, disappointed and disturbed if it was, if it was first, that's so thrusting religion down the throats of those who don't wish for it. I suppose I, I harbor some hope that perhaps um, it could do some good if it really did take into account religious minorities of, of, of different kinds. Because I think I would say that if you wanted to look at a society and figure out whether it's a society 
that really does protect rights for individuals and particularly rights for um, minorities. There are sort of a few groups that I would see as the canaries in the mine shaft. And while religious minorities are not the only one of those, I would see them as one of those. Certainly not the only one. Uh, and therefore, uh, a concern about um, persecution on the basis of religion would seem a, a relevant thing. But who knows what that, what, if anything, is going to come of that. But maybe if, in five years' time, that's <coughs> what I Um, in terms of class <coughs> rights, um, yeah. I just remembered recently that uh, was um, in last November there was this um, um, case in Toronto where a woman was refused uh, a haircut oh, at a barber shop because of uh, the barber uh, based it on um, his religious belief, religious right. beliefs that he doesn't give haircuts to women. Although she asked for something that he normally gives to men, a business haircut. Right. And, uh, so uh, she argued that this is discriminating against um, her right to be give, to not be discriminated against based on sex, uh, uh, given uh, a service that is normally mm. given to public. So I don't know what happened later, but like, I want to know what well, my you music. think. I must admit I wasn't wildly sympathetic toward the complainant in that case. And I really do think <coughs> two things. First of all, the courts themselves have said that the, the discrimination, the harm, the violation, and in this case we would be talking not about the charter but about human rights legislation because it's an individual law. Uh, the government would still make the same principles would be relevant. And but that that that's certainly in the context of freedom of religion, and I would argue also relevant here in the human rights context. But it must be more than a trivial burden. You know what? She's in Toronto. I bet you there's a lot of other places that have cut her hair, and maybe she could go there. And secondly, I think we have to look at it in context. I'm all for gender equality. I think there are areas in which women have been disadvantaged. I think there are areas in which women are still disadvantaged. But I don't think getting a haircut is one of them. And I think that that would be relevant to think about in trying to figure out how you weigh up the rights and wrongs. There are enough true rights and wrongs in the society to lose sleep over without losing sleep over the fact that she might have had to go 10 feet down the road and get her hair cut somewhere else. And frankly, you know, what she, you almost sort of think, was she looking for a cause to be perturbed about? Well, I think that particular, you know, hair cutting place. So I have to admit that I didn't. But would your opinion on that change if... <clears throat> For example, this service was a unique service that only could have been offered at that hair salon. Yeah, maybe. I mean, and if it really, really, a unique service that really mattered. Um, and of course, your response and to that. And take away the triviality of it. Yeah, pie, exactly. Honestly, yeah. Right? Oh, for sure. Something, <laughs> absolutely, at some point, if, I, if you have something that's only, I mean, if, if I'm dying on the street and some doctor goes, <coughs> I only treat men, I think we would all think that that was hugely problematic. And of course, there's a a vast array of scenarios between me dying on the street and me not getting the haircut that I want. Uh, but, but I guess so I would always come back to what, what is the, the weight of the concern here and what is the context? Yeah. Yes. I have a weak question. That is, what, what, if you look at Sharia law and, and, uh, and to what extent it might have application in Canada, Specifically, the freedom of religion section two of the chart. Because I'm, I'm seeing in my practice people wanting to draft wills mm. uh, in accordance with Sharia law, which I have difficulty with because of provincial legislation and whatnot. And I'm just wondering when, when, when in this case, it's going to hit the uh, court. Well, <coughs> the, the big way in which that has hit the law, hit, hit the, the media, I mean, shapes the law is in Ontario around the issue of what law can be used in um, arbitration. So first of all, let me say, um, I know very little about Sharia law. It would be appalling for me to hold myself forward as any kind of an expert, so I'm not going to. Uh, but just to recount for you a little bit, and you, you may well be familiar with it, but for anybody who isn't, uh, what happens in Ontario uh, some years ago uh, there was an announcement by somebody who was going to set up, I can't remember the name of it, but sort of, some sort of institute for Sharia law, 
and that people would be trained there to be arbitrators uh, in, in various sort of private, but particularly family law matters. So if you had an issue with your spouse or your brother or your kid or whomever uh, and didn't want to go to the courts, that you could uh, go to arbitration and have somebody arbitrate in accordance with Sharia law. And whoa, this hit the headlines. And uh, you know, all kinds of groups on, on both sides arguing for it and so on. The Ontario government appointed uh, Marion Boyd, a former attorney general, to do a report on it, which she did. And she recommended that, she wasn't recommending any change, she was actually recommending the status quo. Because up until then, uh, you know, if two people want to get together and arbitrate a matter and appoint someone to be an arbitrator and uh, agree to abide by that arbitration, you can use secular law, you can use religious law, I'm presuming you can use, you know, anything pretty well. Uh, so she said, yes, we certainly should accommodate family arbitrations done in accordance with religious law, specifically in the focus here, Sharia law. Uh, the concern was that uh, vulnerable individuals, and particularly women, might feel pressured into this form of arbitration. And so she had a variety of um, recommendations around process and procedure for protection, or, or at least attempts at protection with regard to that. She writes the report, and the government just says, no, we're banning it. And so now there is uh, a section in the uh, Arbitration Act of Ontario which says basically any other kind of arbitration, non-family arbitration, you go for it, so commercial arbitration, you can do in accordance with religious law if you wish, but um, not family arbitration. Now, of course, that's not, people spoke of that as a ban on family law arbitration based on religious law. It's not really a ban. I mean, if two people get, a, get together in their living room and decide to have something arbitrated in accordance with religious law, it's not like the police are going to break down the door or something. The, the limit on it was if you had a come to an agreement in accordance with religious law, and then one party says, I don't want to do that, I don't want to live up to that, normally you would expect to be able to go to court and have the court enforce the arbitration agreement. But what this amendment to the Arbitration Act in Ontario said is that in family law matters, uh, that if the arbitration decision is to be enforced in the courts, it must have been decided in accordance with Canadian law. Right? So, and there's been significant debate since then as to whether that was a good way to go or not, uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, first of all, um, I think that my understanding is that it cast rather a pall on other forms of religious arbitration that had been clicking along quite nicely, with no one being particularly perturbed about them at all. But, you know, as a lawyer, are you going to keep sending your clients to this religious arbitration if you have to say, but you don't want. Like, if, if one of you wants to back out, you're not going to be able to enforce it in the court. So there's this sort of spillover of that. And also arguments around, um, you know, first of all, do we really think that this is going to stop arbitration, or is it just going to make it sort of more underground? And further, if there is always that concern about voluntariness, but if you could have protections around voluntariness, if two adults decide that they want to have a dispute, a private dispute between the two of them, arbitrated in accordance with a particular set of rules, which each of them gives allegiance to, is there any reason for telling them they can't? simply because that might not be the set of rules that I would give or you would give allegiance to. So there's been a fair bit of discussion on that one, and that's the way the Ontario government went. Yes? Yeah. Just to go back to the hair I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm having trouble with just the, the reasoning. I mean, I have, to, I have not read that scenario, but I mean, just the, just the kind of the, the grammar of how the situation seems to me, if it serves us all in public, and some of our earliest human rights is yeah. about public law and jurisdiction, yeah. it's, it's I'm not serving you a drink or something to eat mm -hmm. because you're black. Yeah. He's in Montreal. He can get yeah. drink anywhere. Yeah. It seems that we're we're willing to carve out, I mean, even human rights claims from the charter right ball. Yeah. License to discriminate. And I mean, I'm, 
I'm yeah. getting a sense of this haircut thing to have some sort of gender component involved. But. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you would have had to So, I mean, what's the difference between impact, which is as severe on the complainant's, on the person's dignity? And, and maybe, maybe that's where I come down, James. I don't want to think it was as much of an impact on her dignity. Right. And maybe, that, maybe it's unfair for me to say that. But frankly, I do think that to be black in Montreal in 1922 or whatever that case was, and to be told that you can't get a drink in a public bar is a profoundly different thing than to tell some woman in Toronto today that she's got to walk down the street and get her hair cut somewhere else. Yeah, I don't see it as being so profoundly different because I mean, <laughs> Part of what I'm reading in this case is that yeah. this is a situation where somebody is obviously, uh, there's something visible about the person that yeah. person does not want to go near the uh, public service. I mean, I don't see them as that far apart on this thing. I guess it would have to depend, too, on what, how we interpreted the religious motivation of the individual, right? Mm -hmm. If the religious motivation of the individual is to go, Oh dear God, you're a woman, you're a second class citizen, how appalling, I want nothing to do with you, get out of my shop, you're defiling my shop, be gone. I would be a heck of a lot more horrified than I'd be, you know, then if, if it was because she was gay, right. then I would be much more upset. That's what I was Much more upset. Oh, see, I didn't, okay, now I figured if it was around sexual orientation, I have huge, I have a huge different views simply because I think that you have to look at the context and you have to look at the vulnerability of the community. And I do not see women seeking haircuts in Toronto as a particularly vulnerable community. I would take a completely different take on it if we, if we uh, introduce sexual orientation. Because right. I would see it as, 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 as much more of a slap in the it's face. Not much more. Gender yeah. yeah. But I think, so I would see that, I might well see that as different, certainly if we brought sexual orientation into it. But I would also want to, in, in, in my example where I did, was assuming that wasn't part of it, I would want to say, well, what's the, what is the uh, motivation? If it is you're a woman and you're defiling the place to get out, that's problematic. If it is my beliefs around modesty or around appropriate interaction between the genders is such that I am actually constrained from having physical contact with you, much as I respect you as a human being, right. that's got to be a different thing, right? I think it does. And therefore, um, I, I would want to look both at the motivation, uh, but also at the community. And, and, and I'm with you. as soon as sexual orientation comes in there, I am going to take a very different um, right. read of that. Yeah. And, and I guess it's sort of, you know, how, how much of a how much of a slap in the face is this? Yeah. So, do you think then in that case that it's fair to say that the discrimination, I guess for something like sexual orientation is sort of a, a more like open wound, it's sort of a fresher thing to discriminate against than gender. Do you know, like, like I think it wouldn't be, yeah. I don't think that people would be as quickly to be offended about being a woman. If someone says, no, I can't serve you because you're a woman, you'd be like, the hell? as opposed to someone saying, I can't serve you because you're gay. Yeah. I think that there's, the roots are deeper in one than they are in the other, that one is more established, you know, the gender equality is more established in today's age than it is the, the sexual orientation established. And so I do want, as I said, I would look at the context, I would look at the vulnerability of the group, I would look at the newness of our willingness to uh, recognize rights. And even within any one of those categories, I would still want to look more at the context. So. Um, if this was anything that kind of had shadings of violence toward women or uh, sexual assault or whatever, those are areas in which, frankly, I don't think our society has moved, but I don't think we've moved anywhere near far enough. And so I might have the same sort of hackles rising on the back of my neck reaction that I would have to, you know, the Christian York case, if you're black, I'm not going to serve you, or you're gay, I'm not going to serve you, or whatever. And so I recognize that's subjective, I recognize different people. We'll have different takes on that. Um, I realize there's no easy test for it, but I also think we've got to think about those hard questions rather than just sort of taking absolute to stand one way or the other. Yes. Um, if you flip it around and um, I walk into a hairdressing establishment and say I'd like to get a haircut, and they say well, we don't cut male hair, yeah. what have I got to complain about? I mean, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, there's a couple of arguments. There's a couple of responses that might be made. Right? One might simply be. Gee, we only cut long hair, uh, we don't know what to do with your short hair. One of the things in today's world, they probably, they probably have cut some yeah. of them's hair that's just as short as yours, right? Um, the, the other argument is, um, 
perhaps that would be less of an affront to your dignity, because frankly, as a man, you'd probably have a the argument would go, being affronted on the grounds of gender as frequently as perhaps a woman has been affronted on the grounds of gender. And I do think that sometimes um, that is relevant to think about. Not always, but sometimes. You know, when there's sort of all this discussion about, not to be able to remember the name of it, you know, the golf club where Tiger Woods is and didn't let women in and so on. People discussing it instead of saying, well, I'm sure this golf club summer they don't let men in. And I think, yeah, there's always a pity little golf club that nobody really wants to get into anyway. Right? I guess very much of this right down the doors to get into these all women golf clubs. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I think you do have to try to calibrate things a little bit. That said, uh, I'm not, I guess because I'm, I'm, I'm never a proponent of sort of all or nothing. I'm not a proponent of the idea of, well, you're a man, anything, nothing can possibly affront you, and I'm a woman, anything can possibly affront me. And I'm certainly not a proponent of that view. I would just sort of say we always have to look at sort of history and context. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is an example for that. I'm not going to identify the community, but one of the communities I deal with, a few years ago, had a rabbi there who did not allow women on the board of the synagogue. Uh, and so the, it was all run by men. He said, that's fair, that's the way it is. They have a sisterhood over there. I don't have a vote in the sisterhood. They do their own things without me. And so that's the way it is. But he didn't apologize for it at all. Should they have challenged him or what? Or, uh, and, and again, I guess I'd say there's a huge difference between what you might do within the religious community and what the state should be able to do. Yeah. Right? Uh, if I didn't within, <laughs> can internally they do more or less whatever they want unless it's utter violation or insulting in some sort of way. Or, I think it would be fair that my take on that would be if I were in that community, I would have been challenging very significantly. But internally. It has uh, been challenged successfully. Yes. But, uh, the the, the idea you... of the state swooping in and trying to change that within a religious institution to me would be really, really crossing the lines of what the state <laughs> should be able to do. I mean, there, there, there would be no problems with that, I would suggest. I have a question. Sure. How does the state define a religion? Really, really, really broadly. Is the answer. So um, we spoke about it in the Constitution and said he used the word God. And he right. used the word religion. Yeah. And that was how it was done yeah. in the Charter. So is there a separation between the, the God and the religion? And that certainly was one of the criticisms of putting, put, putting God in the preamble. There were many criticisms. But one of the criticisms of putting God in the preamble was that that had um, so very Judeo-Christian overtones and didn't sort of speak to other religions. But really, um, the preamble... Did you remove one of the words and, and carry on? In effect, the courts, that's so the effect of the courts, right? I mean, they just sort of said that the preamble's a dead letter, ignore it, pretend it's not there, and let's just go on and focus on section 2A. So there is a distinction between a secular way of doing things and a religious way of doing things? Well, I, mean, I think certainly religion, and this maybe gets back to the comment that Section 2A protects conscience and religion. I think there is some kind of a, of a sense that although none of us can actually articulate it, perhaps we have an idea that religion is different in some way that we might recognize than, say, a, 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 a secular worldview, a secular set of comprehensive. So we're, we're just trying to balance the two. Well, but even within the definition of I'm just wondering oh, yeah. the way you was defined yeah. when you started. So yeah. Certain religion has been defined very broadly, and and yeah. so um, certainly, certainly any of the sort of world religions, but even uh, there's a case saying the witchcraft, sorcery, and conjuration are religions protected other sections. That goes too. back to your sincerity. Yeah. What is sincerity? Yeah. Is there a difference between sincerity and sanity in the case like that? <laughs> <laughs> it focuses it on sincerity. <laughs> that was a serious question, actually. Yeah. Well, the courts have said we are, again, in this Amsterdam case, the court said we can inquire into whether the person challenging the legislation is uh, sincere, although we shouldn't inquire too closely. But we should not be trying to determine whether certain religious doctrines are right or wrong. Right? Because I, 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 I suspect that if you have any religious doctrine you can think of, even those that some of us may hold very close to our hearts, there's somebody else out there who's going to think that that sounds like pure idiocy. Right? Uh, and therefore, it is not the role of a court to go, ooh, that's a nice religion. Ooh, that's, I don't like that doctrine. Oh, no, that doctrine's a bit problematic. 
I mean, obviously, if you hold beliefs that harm others, then that may be a mighty justifiable reason under Section 1 why the government will limit you, not necessarily in your beliefs. You go sit home and think whatever you want to think, but in your actions based on those beliefs. So there really is the possibility, there should be the possibility of limiting freedom of actions based on religion uh, because of harm to others. But um, I would go back to saying that that should be the test that the courts apply, not just, ooh, does that look a bit weird, or ooh, I don't believe that. Yeah, I, I wonder if there's any um, precedent on state laws challenging church laws. And I think in terms of women um, in the Catholic Church, for instance, women not being ordained, mm -hmm. is there any so in other words, challenge yeah. for that? I, I would see it as a huge intrusion and a, and a hugely inappropriate intrusion of the state if the state were to try to tell the Catholic Church that it should ordain women. And, and again, I guess this is one of those situations where I actually think the freedom of religion has to uphold beliefs that I do not share. I'm a member of the United Church. I am a fallen and firm believer of having women in the pulpit. But I would see it as an utter violation of freedom of religion if the state could actually step in and tell a religion that it had to change such a fundamental uh, part of its belief. So I would, I would not support Excuse me. that. Yes. But why do you think that uh, it is possible for religion to go into the issues of state, which is, ah, yes. which is seen every day? Yeah. Like any religion can promote secular values under the cover of this religion to so, all of our society. So, so you're talking about sort of what role should or could religious voices have in trying to uh, affect society or, or the law or whatever? I think that there are religious issues at the stage. There are many religious religions in the world and in Canada. We have only one character. As soon as there's freedom of your religion, uh, there's freedom of my religion. Yep. So that's kind of important. You know, I don't want my rights to be violated because of you. I don't want to sit uh, with all respect to sit. I don't want to sit nearby the person with kill part. I don't want to drive on the road where there is somebody with no picture on his or her, I don't know, uh, driver's license. You know what I mean? As soon as the values and freedoms and rights of the state will be strictly positioned above the rights and freedom of religion, we will have this challenge every day and we discuss it for, for the rest of our life. There, there obviously are huge tensions and huge difficulties there about where you draw the line. And I guess I would always come back to harm, although recognizing that it's a sub subjective view and that people may have very different takes on what would cause harm. Um, and uh, so, for instance, on, on the uh, on the Kirpan, I, I probably wouldn't be comfortable sitting next to somebody, assuming that they were, you know, this, this, a ceremonial a part of their dress. Now, obviously, if they're starting to act erratically or violently, that would be a whole different kettle of fish. Uh, and I think maybe that comes back to the, one of the cases that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there was actually a challenge to ch changes to the RCMP regulations. The RCMP regulations were amended to allow Sikh officers to wear their turban with their uniform. And this was challenged on the grounds that it infringed the freedom of religion of the rest of us. That somehow, perhaps, being arrested by somebody wearing a turban uh, was in violation of your freedom of religion. And the court said no. Uh, and I'm agree with the court on that one, I have to say. Uh, so for me, it would always come back to trying to say, are there, are there real harms here? Are there harms so significant? that that would justify limiting freedom of religion, which I see as a profoundly fundamental freedom. And my answer is yes, sometimes. By golly, yes, sometimes. There are times when it's justified to limit freedom of religion. But I would want to look at those. I would want to look for real harm 
uh, before I, I was willing to, to go in that direction. And I think the other interesting point that you brought up was about sort of what role could religious voices have in trying to influence uh, the secular society, law, politics, and so on. And my view would be that if you're trying to argue or reason or persuade on a matter of public policy, you should be free to do it from whatever your stance is. So, you know, if you're arguing for or against something on secular grounds, say so. If you're arguing for or against something on religious grounds, say so. My only proviso to that would be, once you put your religious views out there as your basis for arguing for or against some um, piece of public policy, you should be as ready to have your religious views uh, discounted, criticized, satirized, whatever else, as any other. So in other words, the parallel that I would make is if I'm speaking in favor of a piece of public policy, and I say I come to this as a feminist, I've got to recognize that some people are going to say feminism is idiocy. Equally, if I say I come to this because of my religious views, I've got to accept that someone is going to look at me and think your religious views are idiocy. And so I should be open to speak to issues of, of public policy from a religious basis, and that should be welcome and fine, but with the proviso that then I have been willing to have my religious views criticized just as I would have any of my secular views criticized. Anything else? Okay. I was wondering if I could ask you to comment on Trinity Western University uh, request to host a, a law school. Yeah. So I think it's an interesting, I mean, private religious educational institution is not new, yeah. but uh, it, I guess it first raised the question about the roles of lawyers and, and you know, regulated mm. It's a tough one, and I go back and forth on so, so there's a University of West, uh, of BC, Trinity Western, that is thinking about setting up a, a law school. It's a privately funded religious university. And um, the controversy is around the fact that as a student, and I think probably also as faculty, if you are a student there or hired there, you have to sign the sort of code of conduct that says we adhere to these um, religious values and we won't engage in any of these ungodly acts which list a bunch of stuff including um, homosexual activity. So the issue is, well first of all the background, the case the, the university first really kind of caught the public eye some years ago when it applied to have a teacher training certificate. Up until then it had been you could take your four years at Trinity Western but you had to go to Simon Fraser or somewhere else to get your last year to get your teacher certificate to be able to teach in the public schools. And Trinity Western applies to say, no, we'd like to be able to educate somebody here for all five years and turn them out and newly into a teacher. And the regulatory um, body in, um, in, in BC that would be approving such a thing turned it down because of this um, statement that, that, teach, that um, professors and students had to sign. And, and the courts. I think maybe, it went to Supreme Court of Canada, and this is one of the cases where the court says there is no hierarchy of rights. I think maybe the court kind of danced around the issue a bit, but ultimately said um, you would need to provide, if you're going to refuse the right to, for the school to have this fifth year of teacher training, you're going to have to prove that there is harm. In other words, you're going to have to prove that teachers who come through uh, five years of Trinity Western teacher training are going to be more homophobic in the classroom than teachers who come through four years of Trinity Western training plus a year at Simon Fraser. And the court, majority of the court said you really don't have evidence on that. And I think the sort of sad truth underlying part of the argument was, you know what, you could be a teacher from some other university and still be homophobic, right? It's not that we've managed to get rid of homophobia uh, among everybody else. So now this university is thinking of setting up its own law school. And presumably, those who talked there and who went there would have to sign the same thing. And so, you know, the sort of debate about what one's response to that should be. I mean, certainly at a, at a personal level, it's not something that makes me at all happy. I was asked 
um, by somebody I know to contribute financially to the setting up of the university. And I said, I can't. I simply can't because of the stance on this issue. Um, but again, you know, do we do we say that the state can um, prevent people with those religious beliefs from getting together and training lawyers? Uh, do we say that it can be justified because those lawyers will have a role, you know, it's not just like training plumbers or something, they're going to have a role in the development of the law and in the articulation of the law, including equality rights and freedom of religion and so on. Um, so that, that, those are the issues at stake, and uh, I'm not quite sure what I think the answer is on that one. I, 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 I know I feel real um, dis-ease at the thought of such a law school, and yet I also know that I have a duty to sort of interrogate myself and ask whether I am simply saying, you know, no law school for those who believe differently than I do, sort of thing. So I'm not sure. Yes, teachers just taught training in courts. You know, the thing you don't. If you, if you were overtly homophobic in the classroom and were caught behaving in that way, there probably would be sanctions for you. But we don't actually sort of um, look into people's minds and souls as they're going to teach a training and try to ferret out exactly what it is that they're actually believing before it's translated into action. And so, yes, I mean, there certainly could be, um, and there would be in, in any law school, people who hold wildly diverse views uh, on some of these issues and who will go out. And, and the lawyers. And, and as I say, on the one hand, um, <coughs> there is certainly a level of discomfort. On the other hand, the idea that we say that you know, all lawyers must sort of fit within this <coughs> can also have problems. Yeah, so I think I'm, I'm better at seeing the, the difficulties and the arguments on both sides than necessarily knowing what's the perfect answer. <coughs> so I think that is. 8.30, which I think was a time at which we promised to liberate people. <laughs> Just first off, to remind you, ask you to fill in the comment sheets. We do take your comments seriously as we continue to work on improving um, the program. The second is to let you know that the next session of these is on March 6th. It's on disability and human rights, implementing the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So we welcome you all to come back on March 6th. And finally, I would ask you to join me in thanking Diana for laying out